And we are, God willing, going to finish up Philippians chapter 4 this evening. We saw in chapter 1, the single mind, which has attitude of magnifying Christ in every situation, bringing him in to the situation. So um, those who desperately need to see him can. And uh, we must choose to rejoice. Rejoicing is a choice. In chapter two, we saw that lowly mind of Christ, the servant mind, an example in the Lord Jesus, in Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. And then last week, we looked at Philippians three. We saw Paul's past, his present, and his future. His past is great zeal and religiosity uh, to, to serve the Lord. But when he came to the truth of Christ, he found out everything he was doing had no value at all. And then we saw Paul's passion about uh, knowing the fellowship of the Lord, the fellowship of his sufferings. They might experience his resurrection life in a more practical way. And then his longing to be with the Lord, uh, that higher calling he had, pressing forward, forgetting those things behind, looking forward to getting a Christ-like body and uh, being with the Lord in heaven. Wearsby suggests that if we do practice the single mind of chapter one, the servant mind of chapter two, and the spiritual mind of chapter three, then we'll get to enjoy the secure mind of chapter four. And that's really the subject matter um, in this chapter is, is laying hold of the peace of God, uh, in learning contentment in all things. Chapter four, verse one, therefore my beloved, and long for, brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Iodia and I implore Suntike to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I'm going to pause the reading there. There was um, a contention between two sisters in the church at Philippi, um, Eodia. And I know it looks like Sintichi or Sintiki, but in the Greek, it's actually Sundike, which to me sounds better for a woman's name anyway. But uh, there was this uh, contention between two sisters, and it was uh, causing a um, stress within the, the local meeting. And I'm sure that's never happened since these days back in the early church history. <laughs> Paul gives us a wonderful example here of exhortation, and I just want to comment on that. The idea of encouragement is someone is going the right way and we're adding energy to that so they keep going the right way. The idea of exhortation really means to come alongside. So we see a believer, they're, they're headed kind of off in a direction where we know they're gonna get into trouble. We come alongside and love, kind of put our arm around them. Say, you know, if you keep going that way, you're gonna get in trouble. And we kind of turn them a little bit and then send them off uh, so they keep, they keep out of trouble. So exhortation is the idea, it's not a rebuke, it's just coming alongside and offering to turn. And we need that. Hebrews 3 tells us that we need it daily. And uh, so don't be, don't have your feelings get hurt if somebody exhorts you. If it's profitable, take it in. If it's not, just forget about it. Uh, notice the tender language that Paul uses. And I would suggest he gives us a three-step process here for rightly uh, exhorting. Uh, first of all, he affirms love. Uh, he says, my beloved, my long for brethren, my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Very tender language. So he's affirming love. That's if someone um, doesn't know that you love them, if you don't have that kind of a relationship with them, exhortation doesn't go over very well. But if the person that's exhorting you, um, you have a, such a relationship with them that you know that he or she loves you, then exhortation is much more uh, better received. 
So he says, I implore. So there is an urgency here. He, he didn't want this dispute, this ruckus, whatever it was to continue going because it had a potential of bringing people, other people into it, a choosing of sides, causing a rift in the meeting. <clears throat> so he felt that this was a, a pressing matter to get resolved for the sake of the assembly. So he says, I implore Yodia, I implore uh, Sundike to be of the same mind. So Paul starts out by affirming love, and now he gives the correction. You need to have the same mind. We learned in chapter two, the only way that we believers can uh, get along, have unity, is if we have that lowly mind of Christ, which doesn't exalt our own interests, but takes a humble place and puts uh, others' interests ahead of our own. And then thirdly, he affirms love again. He talks about um, this true companion. Now, the Greek word here is um, zezukos. It means um, a, yoke, a yoke fellow. It's probably not a proper name. It's probably just referring to an individual, possibly Timothy, possibly Epaphroditus. It, it could be a proper name. We're not really told who this is, but there was a third party that Paul was soliciting to help these uh, two sisters to adopt the lowly mind of Christ. Help these women who labored with me in the gospel. And so he finishes with the positive. These women were important to him. They labored with him. They were helpful to him. And that's a nice three-step process to exhortation. Affirm love, give the correction, and then end on a positive note. Uh, that's the taste in their mouth when they depart. He says their names are written in the book of life. So these were clearly believers uh, that the Lord had died for, deserving of love. They just needed help in order to come into unity and not um, bring havoc within the church. It's very hard to be an intercessor, a mediator between uh, two factions if we don't love them. And um, Paul is showing that he, that he loves them. And uh, he's basically pleading for steadfastness and unity in these first three verses, dealing with personal issues, personal problems. Um, th this is a real uh, problem in a number of assemblies where there's been uh, sometimes between families or individuals an ongoing dispute or uh, hostility or uh, a coldness a resentment that goes on for years and it really stifles the work of the holy spirit within the meeting so he wants them all to enjoy um, the lord have joy in the lord and uh, be of one mind I would suggest that verse four is probably a good theme verse for the entire epistle. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. And again, I say rejoice. Well, it doesn't say that, does it? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, rejoicing is a choice. While Paul was in prison in chapter one, there were um, those that were speaking ill of him. Uh, he was incarcerated. He didn't have liberty. And yet he didn't set his mind on that. He set his mind on what the Lord, good things the Lord was doing with it. It was stirring up weaker brethren to preach the gospel. He was able to reach those within the palace. And even those that were speaking against Paul were still preaching Christ. So he could rejoice in that. He chose to put his mind on those things that Christ was doing, the good things that Christ was doing out of the hardship. So we really can rejoice always. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in that, last part of the chapter in that series of imperative commands, very short, uh, we're to rejoice always and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God. For a number of years, um, it says give thanks for all things or in all things and everything give thanks. So I thought Okay, here's something bad. I'll find something good in what's bad and give the Lord thanks for that. In everything, give thanks. I can find something good. 
to thank the Lord for in that hard situation. But then in Ephesians 5.20, it says, give thanks for all things. So that kind of closed the loopholes. And I think this is what Paul is getting at. If we really believe that the Lord Jesus is sovereign, that he's all powerful, all knowing, all seeing, he's immutable, he's eternal. If we understand his character, his attributes, his faithfulness to his word. Why couldn't we rejoice and be thankful for all things, knowing that he is going to bring honor to himself, work a greater good on our behalf, Romans 8, 28, and also uh, display himself to those who need to see the Lord Jesus. Our family reads magazines, Christian magazines after dinner, usually each evening. Um, we read Quarterstone, Seema Mill. Uh, magazine and also the voices of the martyrs and the voices of the martyrs it's amazing story after story of how christians are being persecuted how they've lost loved ones um, a lot of through hostile actions of hindus and muslims and so forth buddhists um, they suffer the loss of their homes they've suffered the loss of limbs stress and yet God is using those situations to bring the oppressors to Christ. In other words, when people don't behave like the natural man would, it gets their attention that there's something to uh, the faith of the person they're persecuting. We saw that back in chapter one, that when we suffer patiently and rejoice in the Lord, it's not only a token of our salvation, it's also uh, a statement to our oppressors. It brings conviction to their conscience. So we really can rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. It says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The idea here is moderation. The Lord is at hand. So Paul reminds uh, the saints that he's coming back, that there would be accountability at his judgment seat. So there should be moderation. There should be gentleness, contentment in all that we do. How do we get there? Be anxious for some things. It doesn't say that. It says be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. In other words, a mood of prayer uh, and supplications. That's the specific request. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Hudson Taylor had a saying that he pictured his burdens as big boulders and he would roll his burdens upon the Lord. And uh, this is what prayer does. And if we go to before the Lord, we don't have to be anxious about anything. We just roll our burdens upon the Lord. We specifically tell him of the needs that uh, were our prayers are guided by thanksgiving. Daniel gives us a great example of that in chapter 6. The king's law was signed against him. Anyone praying to anyone but the king for 30 days would be fed to the lions. Uh, Daniel doesn't go to the law office. He didn't even go to the king to appeal his situation. He goes to his upper room. He had an open window relationship with the Lord. And it says he gave thanks. There's no record of him even complaining or telling the Lord about a situation. He knew the Lord knew all about it. But for Daniel to get on his knees and give thanks to the Lord showed what he knew of the Lord's goodness and faithfulness. And so if we really do have the right uh, understanding of who God is, then we don't have to get rattled and discouraged and fret. Um, we can just give these things to the Lord. The, Anxiety has the meaning of being pulled in different directions, like horses tied onto limbs, pulling in, other, in all directions at the same time. That's, that's anxiety. Worry has a connotation of strangling. Um, and I would say that anxiety and worry are the two greatest thieves of the believer's joy. Rejoicing is a choice. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we allow 
these two enemies to rob us of the joy and peace that we can have in Christ. So next time you're in a hard place, just start rejoicing and thanking the Lord. It will do your soul good, and it shows the Lord that you really trust him. And as a result, we get the peace of God in verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Greek word for guard there is, uh, it's a military term, and uh, it means to garrison, a fortify. And so we enjoy the peace of God. It's beyond all understanding. How can we rejoice? How can we be thankful in hard situations? And that peace will guard our hearts and minds. It'll be a garrison, a fortress. Uh, don't let anybody take your peace or your joy. That's something we get from the Lord and nobody should rob it and nor should we relinquish it. Then he talks about um, enjoying the peace of God. In the, the next few verses, he tells us how to maintain a, a proper thought life so we can uh, just enjoy God's peace. He says, finally, brother, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So there's six patterns of thought that Paul gives us, which are virtuous and praiseworthy, which are display moral excellence and deserve commending. So the six are, is it true? Is it genuine? Is it, is it real? Reliable? <clears throat> is it transparent? Noble? Is it worthy of respect? Just? Is it righteous? Right? Faultless? Is it upright? Is it pure? The, the word here is unmixed or untainted. It speaks of a wholesome character that's not untainted. Is it lovely? Uh, is it admirable? Is it something that is appreciated by others? And a good report or good repute. Uh, sounding well. It's... Uh, constructive, applicable, helpful. So these are the things that we should be thinking on. And uh, I call this the Philippians 4.8 test uh, filter. If we have our Philippians 4.8 filter up on our ears and our eyes, then we're not going to allow anything to come into our mind that doesn't pass this test. And if we would just have the filter on, we wouldn't have to deal with a lot of garbage that comes in. And so that's not... Uh, make excuses or sidestep what Paul is saying. If we want to enjoy the peace of God, we're going to have to practice these uh, patterns of thought. Uh, the battle's really between the ears, and what we let come in through our ear gate and eye gate is uh, then what we have to do battle with. These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, Paul practiced these things, so he says, do these. These do and the God of peace will be with you. So he talked about the peace of God, and he's telling them that if you have these kind of thought patterns, the God of peace will be with you. In other words, if you walk in the light and in communion with God, then his peace will be with you, and the God of peace will be walking alongside of you. Like Proverbs 23, 7, um, what you think in your your mind and your heart, that's what you become. So he is. So let's be careful what we uh, allow our minds to ponder and think on. Uh, just take it captive. I Sometimes I, I picture like these little black calves going around the corral in my mind. I just get a little lasso and I grab them and yank them out. Uh, don't let your imagination go. Don't ponder something. If it doesn't pass the test, just no mercy, mortify, yank it out and train your mind not to go back. He says, um, then he talks about his sufficiency in Christ, but I rejoice in the Lord 
greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. I really appreciate Paul's attitude here. I'll show you in just a few minutes that the church at Philippi was one of the churches that gave Paul gifts of fellowship, uh, quite likely more than the other churches. And there was a period of time where he hadn't received a gift until Epaphroditus brought him a gift while he was in prison. And so he gives him the benefit of the doubt here in verse 10. He says, but you lacked opportunity. And I think that's very gracious. He didn't blame them for being uh, negligent and giving to him, meeting his needs. He says, I know you just, you lacked opportunity to do so. And may we also give believers the benefit of the doubt. Often we allow our minds to jump to conclusions. Uh, the facts aren't uh, even known to us. Our minds tend to gravitate to the negative. Um, for the love of Christ, that's uh, think positive. If, if we can't think positive about a situation, give the benefit of the doubt. And if you can't give the benefit of the doubt until you know the facts, just train your mind not to think on it because we'll fill in the details. And we don't want to think negatively on our brothers and sisters, especially when there's not sufficient evidence to do so. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And then he explains that. I know how to be a base, and I know how to abound. Paul knew what it was like to be hungry, um, to not have a proper housing or clothing. He also knew what it was for being the Lord's care and, and have those things. Everywhere in all things, I have learned. And um, I like this. This is muo uh, in the Greek. It's a perfect tense verb. He, he had learned, and what he had learned is going to have an effect, ongoing effect for the rest of his life. This was, he had experientially learned, and it was going to mark him for the rest of his life and even into eternity. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. It didn't really matter if he had a lot or little, it didn't matter. His joy was in the Lord. He was content in the Lord. If the Lord, uh, if he didn't have what he needed, the Lord was teaching him something. So he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's another key um, verse in the epistle. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's really the Verse four would be a good verse, theme verse for the epistle, and verse 13 would be a good uh, theme verse for chapter four. The secure mind, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, it doesn't mean that there's going to be some times that we don't, um, we're abased, we, we lack. And in those times, uh, I would suggest that we evaluate our situation uh, with that spiritual mind of chapter three, and that we optimize where we can. It could be the Lord's teaching us how to optimize, be more efficient, um, do more with less. And then where we have a legitimate need, after we've evaluated with the spiritual mind, then we give that to the Lord, as Paul says in verse five, we let our supplications with thanksgiving go to the Lord and be thankful. I find that often when there is a lack, it's the Lord is teaching us something or he's setting up something uh, which has his signature on it and he's gonna bring honor and glory to himself by answering the, the situation. He says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So when Paul departed from there, um, the saints at Philippi uh, shared with Paul. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again. So there's two more times that this church had supported Paul when he was at Thessalonica. 
And then also we know from this epistle that they had sent fellowship to him while he was in prison. And I found another reference in the second Corinthians 11, nine um, for a fifth time that the saints of Philippi had sent Paul a gift. So we have at least five times recorded in scripture where this church was sharing in the gospel. Uh, he thanks them for the fellowship of the gospel in chapter one. Uh, they may not be, have a, a um, apostolic calling. They may not be missionaries, but they could still take part in the gospel work by sending funds, uh, sending clothes, uh, taking care of the necessities of the Lord's servants. And Paul was very thankful for that. He says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. He was more interested in the eternal value uh, of their gift to him, what that earned, even more than the benefit that it gave uh, Paul here in the temporal sense. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. Having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well pleasing to God. When we praise God with sincerity, that is a sweet smelling sacrifice. When we give to others in the name of the Lord through the Spirit, um, the prompting of the Spirit, uh, without selfishness, that's a sweet smelling sacrifice. Um, when we give to um, others, our time, our resources, uh, unselfishly, that is a sweet smelling sacrifice. If the flesh is not in it and we're giving, that pleases the Father. It's, uh, it's like putting incense on the golden altar of incense that ascends up into heaven. God smells it and he says, I appreciate that. That smells like my son. Well, he's the one who is offering it. And so all these things are sweet aromas to the Lord. Verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And my God, that's the name of the banker, shall supply all your need. That's the value of the note. According to his riches, that's the capital of the bank. In glory, that's a bank's address by Christ Jesus. That is the signer of the note. And so it's kind of a neat little way uh, to look at that verse. Um, God has great resources. He has all resources available to him. And he can meet all of our needs for the, in his riches of grace for the glory of Christ Jesus. And then we have the, the conclusion to the epistle. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. I love that. Sometimes we have our favorite brothers and sisters we like to talk to. But in Christ, everyone is equal. And so we should make a habit of, of showing the love of God to all the believers. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are Caesar's household. This showed the power of the gospel that Paul talked about in chapter one. Some within Caesar's own household, within the palace had come to Christ and they were adding their um, their howdies, so to speak, to Paul's epistle. And then a classic conclusion of a Pauline epistle, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. It's a really rich book. This is my favorite uh, books in the New Testament. It's uh, a book that shows us how to maintain our joy in the Lord and not be robbed. Don't let uh, anxiety pull you apart. Don't let uh, worry, strangle you, uh, come before the Lord with your supplications uh, in prayer and having uh, joy and thanksgiving on our lips and in our hearts. If we are mindful to watch our thought life. We can maintain this wonderful communion with the God of peace and enjoy his peace. And uh, Paul had learned that. In whatever situation he was, whether he lacked or whether he had much, it didn't matter. His joy was in the Lord and nobody could take that from him. He learned to be content. And uh, he learned to be thankful as this epistle shows. Father, we just thank you for 
these precepts. Um, we would like to make these more evident in our lives. We pray that we be more settled, just rolling our burdens upon you for you, you care for us, as Peter says. We pray that we would be able to come before you uh, in prayer whenever we are tried and stressed, but doing so with thanksgiving and rejoicing, knowing that you're a good God that does good. We pray, Father, you'd help us watch our thoughts and um, what we let come through the eye gate and ear gate. It's so much easier not to have to wrestle with things if we never let them in. Pray, Father, we'd learn contentment. Pray that we'd be thankful um, just for the grace that you give us and uh, the companionship, the presence that we can enjoy every day. We thank you, O oh God, that we have this place of peace under your wing in the heavenly places, a secret place. And uh, we're thankful that in Christ we get to enjoy the God of peace. We pray these things in his name.